acts when there is a pro when there is a protocol. Now the question is the second question: which one is the best protocol? And to answer that, I have structured my talk in this way. I'll first give you some basic facts about neonatal in, uh, enteral nutrition, which I think we have done in the past, and Junaid has also done so in the past. Then I will give you nutri nutrient requirements of quantity and quality. And then a checklist for developing protocols and guidelines. Everything, and then go item by item, uh, evidence-based recommendation using our own particular protocol or guideline. And the importance of having standardized feeding protocol, followed by just one slide on post-discharge advice, because that has changed recently. And at the end of this presentation, I hope <clears throat> you will have all the information required to develop your own standardized feeding protocol if you don't have one already. So let's start with some basic facts. The fetus is formed between zero to 12 weeks. From 12 to 18 weeks, there's organogenesis, that is the organs are developing and maturing, but the growth actually of the fetus starts from 18 weeks onwards. And it's an exponential growth. It's a very rapid growth. The fetus grows from 18 weeks to, uh, by about 18 to 20 grams per kilo per day, slows down a bit at 32 weeks and then slows down even further at 37 weeks. Now, the first thing which I need to mention is that in Pakistan, the prematurity rate is between 15 and 18 percent. And that means about 900,000 uh, babies a year miss out some part of this uh, growth velocity or some part of this growth spurt. The second fact, which is very important, is that premature infants have a greater nutritional need in the neonatal period than any other time in life. From zero to till death, the nutritional needs in the neonatal period are much, much higher for anyone. In addition, quite often premature infants have other morbidities. For example, if they have RDS, then they require uh, approximately 30% more uh, in, in, in terms of energy and calories just to meet their nutritional requirements. To, uh, to add to all this is that they have physiological Im intestinal immaturity, they have reduced enzymatic activity in the gut, and the gut motility is reduced, thus increasing their chances of microbial dysbiosis, that is increasing their chances of developing NEC or and malabsorption. Therefore, the very important fact that providing ad adequate nutritional support and I again want to stress this, that I will be talking about the context in which I have worked, but you will have to develop it in your own context with your own given resources. It's the great, greatest challenge for every neonatal clinician. At a practical level, what does this mean? It means to choose feeding and nutritional practices that provide the neonate with his or her expected physical and organ growth that improves their long-term outcome without causing metabolic stress or disease. Now, this is not an easy task. Having done neonatology for 50 years, I still find it extremely difficult to meet this challenge. A fact which is often ignored by many colleagues and certainly many uh, pediatricians is that preterm babies at birth weigh less than what they would have weighed if they had remained in utero. That means if they had not delivered prematurely. And that means that at the very onset, they are growth restricted. So their growth pattern is very different. But the paradox for us as clinicians is whilst we know the rate of intrauterine growth we do not know the optimum postnatal growth velocity of preterm babies. And this is extremely important because long term outcome what nutrition is. And as you know, the, what was called in the past fetal onset of adult disease, or the, as it is called now, developmental onset of health and disease. And so that is important that we do not know what the optimal uh, postnatal growth velocity is. And to just put this uh, 
developmental origins of health and disease in perspective, the first thousand days in our life are the most important in our life. The reason being that from the day of evolution till birth and a little later, this is a critical or uh, sensitive period where epigenetic changes are taking place and the cell programming taking place under the influence of two factors. Pre-birth, before the baby is born, depends on maternal health and placental health. And the post-birth, it depends on quantity and quality of nutrition which we provide. And we quite often ignore this fact that we do not know what happens to these preterm uh, pre babies once they are discharged from our neonatal unit. But you know, from uh, with a gap of years or even decades, they may end up with what is called the developmental origin of health and disease. They have much higher incidence of coronary artery disease, of diabetes, and uh, and so 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 on. Now, the important thing here for us is that preterm infants were born early, spend most of these thousand days under our care, and thus this puts a great responsibility on us who are looking after these preterm babies. And we have once in a lifetime opportunity to optimize the health or over life course of an individual baby. So what we do today to these babies, how we look after them and how we feed them is going to affect them 20 years, 30 years, 40 years down the line. But we tend to forget we just take care while the baby is in the neonatal unit and when forget what we are doing may have an effect 40 years down the line. Now to meet and make it better, many agencies have developed nutritional requirements. And this is from the European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition. Uh, they have just updated their uh, recommendation for nutritional energy requirements uh, last week. And I'm very grateful to Naveed who provided me with the pre-publication uh, manuscript of this document. What they have really done is uh, just tinkered a little bit. They have increased their uh, amount of fluid. Uh, they have increased the energy requirement, in fat requirement, carbohydrate, potassium, uh, calcium, uh, phosphorus, and zinc. But there is very little change in what they had recommended uh, 10 years or 12 years ago. Now, these numbers are important. But what is more important is to recognize the interdependency between nutrition and energy. Nutrition is defined as the amount of nutrition needed to support normal growth and development. Whereas energy is what is released from the breakdown of these nutrients, which uh, you have we have listed here, uh, to build tissues and organs and body mass. So good nutrition is more than simply just achieving these numbers which we often do on our ward rounds uh, and, uh, and, uh, and put down on, uh, on paper. It is important to recognize the interdependence between nutrients and energy. And this is what I will uh, make clear in the next couple of slides. Just to, uh, as an example, just to show you, this is an old slide. Uh, how do we perform? This is the re protein requirement between yellow so uh, yellow bars, this is how much protein we are able to provide. And you can see every day we increase the deficit. And this nutritional deficit uh, should be considered as atrogenic malnutrition, which is responsible for more than 50% of extra uterine postnatal growth restriction. And this is even true today. The latest figure, figures I have is from the United States. 31% of babies discharged from the neonatal unit uh, in, U in the US have extra uterine growth restriction. The other figures are old. I could not get the latest figures. I have no idea what happens uh, to preterm babies who are discharged home from in Pakistan. But recently, uh, Tazi in, in two, uh, 2018 published a global incidence of extra uterine growth restriction and showed that in between 60 and 70% of preterm babies who are discharged from the neonatal unit suffer from extra uterine growth restriction and only less than 30% uh, go without EUGR. So EUGR is a major problem uh, in our provision of nutrition to the preterm infants. Why is this so? So why can't we get more babies to go with the appropriate weight? 
One of the reasons is our main focus in preterm care is cardiorespiratory issues. And this is very obvious, even in, the, uh, even in our academic group where we discuss this kind of ventilation, that kind of ventilation, this antibiotic for sepsis, that antibiotic for sepsis, but very, very rarely have I seen a discussion on nutrition of preterm infants. The other reason is that we have alarms. If the saturation goes down, the alarm goes up. If the heart rate goes down, the alarm goes up but we do not have in the neonatal intensive care unit an alarm system which will tell us that the baby is not getting enough protein, the baby is not getting enough energy. And that is one of the reasons why we do not have, uh, we, still so many babies are discharged home with extra uh, uterine growth restriction. Even on ward rounds, we often discuss the fluid volumes, calories, but forget uh, to determine the actual energy intake which the baby is getting. And as Julian, Julian Schneider from Switzerland has shown that high energy intake, not necessarily growth, which we plot quite regularly on growth chart during the first two weeks of life is crucial for brain growth and white matter maturation in preterm because 70 percent of energy between when we give these babies nutrition uh, from 25 26 weeks onwards 70 percent of the nutrition <coughs> of the energy is used for brain growth and 40 percent of our brain volume Ladies and gentlemen, 40% of our brain volume develops during this period. So if we do not provide adequate nutrition during this period, we have a problem with brain growth and we have a problem uh, with uh, you know, the long-term outcome of these babies. Another fact, which is very crucial and which I don't think is uh, paid much attention to, is that when we talk about retinopathy of prematurity, we talk about high oxygen saturation causes ROP. But colleagues and friends, low energy intake, particularly lipid during the first four weeks of life, increases the risk of severe ROP. As you can see here, as the energy intake falls, the incidence of ROP rises. Every 10 kilocalories uh, increase per day decreases the incidence of ROP by 24%. And so ROP is not only related to oxygen, but is also related to the energy intake. And this beautiful study by Black Static five or six years ago using MRI diffusion tensor imaging showed that those babies who were shown uh, moving lights uh, and have been given adequate had been given adequate nutrition, uh, their brains lighted up, whereas those babies who had low nutrition, their brain was lighting up much less. And this is when some forms of face uh, was shown to the babies. You can see that the uh, cerebellar region lighted up in the babies who had received good nutrition, whereas compared to babies who were not getting enough energy. So where does the energy come from? Most of the energy comes from protein. There are about 400 different proteins in human milk. But the question is, is the quantity which uh, important or the quality? If you have more arginine in your protein, then the gut mucosal integrity is better. If you have glutamine, for example, again, gut maturity and integrity is better. So what is the key is that giving the right protein, right amount at the right kind of protein at the right time. And something which we also, don't often pay attention is that we have a number and we say we are giving X uh, uh, 4.1 or 4.3.1 grams of protein per kilo per day. But actually, the younger the baby, the later the gestation, the more the protein requirement because the growth, the velocity is much higher. And babies near term require less protein than uh, the babies at very preterm. So you have to have the right amount of protein. And if you give the right amount of protein, and these are 15 trials, over 1,000 babies for each gram increase in protein intake, the mental development index increases by eight points. So you make them better. They become politicians, not uh, doctors. But if you, uh, and for every kilo calorie, um, uh, increase of energy, the, the MDI increases by four points, uh, 4.6 points, and it decreases in the same amount if you provide less energy. But can we do better? Is the quantity enough? 
Well, when you look at quantity, if you look at one gram of protein, and look at the functional activity of that protein in the TPN solution where we give amino acids, very little functionality. If, uh, in formula milk, in formula milk, there is some functionality. In breast milk, there is four times higher uh, functionality uh, in the quality of protein. So it is the quality uh, along with the quantity which matters. And this paper, which was on, published only yesterday in the Journal of Medicine, uh, where they added uh, one gram uh, uh, of amino acid increased in the, in the TPA in the first five days of life showed no advantage, uh, neurological advantage in uh, two years follow-up. And in fact, in some cases was much more harmful. So it's not only appropriate quantity, but it is the quality which also matters. The same, so it is the quality which matters. The same is true for lipids. Lipids are essential for brain growth. There are about 27 trials, over a thousand infants. And again, uh, Schneider from Switzerland has shown beautifully doing still MRIs that if you adequate lipids, the brain volume increases, the brain basal nuclei increases, and the cerebellum and the basal ganglia increase, which is the important for neurocognitive act. But is the amount important or is the quality important or both are important both are important the quality the amount we know we should be giving it between four five and eight uh, grams of uh, lipid per kilo per day but what should they contain if you look at formula milk and breast milk the fat content is the same but when you look at the uh, amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids and long chain poly uh, saturated fatty acids they're much much higher in breast milk and these are uh, are the lipids which improve brain growth and function. The uh, lipids which come in the formula milk come from fish or coconut oil or soya, and they do not have that amount of PUFA. So to achieve adequate brain growth and neuronal growth, the intake of it should be somewhere between 25 and 30 grams. A human milk, uh, exclusive human milk will provide about 21, but if you do formula, it will provide only six to 10 grams per day. So again, with lipids, it's the same as protein. It's the quantity, but also the quality. Carbohydrate is exactly the same. Um, in, the, in, in the human milk, there's much more lactose, and it has also pucolacyl uh, lactose, which helps in the absorption, better growth of friendly bacteria. But far more important, and look, at how Allah has created this. The oligosaccharides, which are necessary for gut maturity, for gut development, and for better microbiome and gut repair, is much higher in preterm formula, uh, preterm uh, milk of the mother rather than the term milk. So there is every reason uh, that preterm milk and uh, human milk is much better than giving anything else. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Now, having given you the basic facts, let us see how we develop the protocol. Well, there is a standard checklist. We all have a checklist. We should have who has made it, who, where does it belong to, for whom is it, and all that. But there are three things which are extremely important. It should be evidence-based. And in our our practice and what we I will go on to show you, we have used this hierarchy of systematic reviews being at the top, and we pay very little attention to editorials, expert opinion, or case series. That is number one. Number two, we must, it is not a document which is there for ever and ever. It should have a date of when it was pre uh, prepared and a date for revision. When will it be reviewed? Because uh, practices change very rapidly, and therefore the revision is important. And last but not the least, it is extremely important that all stakeholders have uh, ownership of this. And anyone who deviates from uh, using uh, the protocol must uh, document good reason why this is so. And then this reason should be reviewed uh, so that the policy can be changed or altered if necessary. So let us start with our policy with what I we have done and what our protocol is and that's and I will give you the evidence for it and what uh, what we do. So the first thing which is I just wanted to put this slide because I love this uh, statement. Allah has said said to us 
we must breastfeed, we must give human milk, we must breastfeed, 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 period. There is no, um, no differentiation between any gestation uh, here. Accepted this, and this is an essay which my, uh, Lawrence Weaver wrote last year. Uh, the essay was called "The White Milk." Milk has been life and death of babies, and their fortunes have often turned on whether they were fed naturally or artificially. And there can be no further truth than that. Babies who are fed naturally do better, and babies who are fed artificially don't do as well. Our policy is to use exclusive human feed. Fee. That's our recommendation, grade A evidence, because as I've enumerated, they have high and good fat levels. They have arachidonic acid, which is important for neuronal growth. They have large milk fat globules, which are absorbed much, much more easily. They have already got probiotics. They have hemopoietic cells. I've already enumerated the oligosaccharides. They have stem cells. They have lactoferrin. I will talk to, uh, tell you, show you that in a minute. And they have secretory IgA, which forms a layer and prevents uh, uh, infection in the gut. So there is evidence that exclusive breastfeeding is associated with 12% reduction in mortality and 18% better neurodevelopmental outcome. That is why our recommendation is to use exclusive human milk feeding. WHO endorses that and also suggests that. And only if the above is, uh, that is mother's milk or donor milk is not available, only then they would suggest that using standard formula. The re other reason why we think human milk should be used that even if mother doesn't feed and get to have enough uh, human milk, even getting small amounts, even getting 50% of the feed uh, from on the mother, the survival curves for sepsis, NEC, and are much better than those babies who do not get any of mother's milk. But more importantly, if you look at mothers who breastfeed for two months or longer, these, these babies have a much better mental composite processing uh, ability, and this is sustained for at least two years or more. Now, quite often uh, when mothers deliver prematurely, there is uh, there is an excuse that we don't have enough milk coming. And so there is a recent study uh, by Parker. The recommendation is C because it needs to be uh, 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 re-evaluated. Um, re and uh, early what uh, Parker has shown that if you ask, uh, start expression within the first hour of birth or within the first six hours, then the yield of uh, uh, breast milk improves tremendously. The volume gets much better. Of course, nothing. There, uh, there are issues with breast milk. And I do not dispute that, and I do not dis uh, dispute it, because one of the reasons is we do not encourage our mothers uh, uh, antenatally uh, and uh, tell them the advantages of breastfeed uh, breastfeeding. So only 37% of mo uh, mothers uh, breastfeed premature babies who are born prematurely. And it's also true that the milk composition varies, and it's not may not be sufficient uh, sufficient to have enough uh, calories or enough micronutrients that <coughs> that needs to, and vitamins. These these need to be supplemented in human milk uh, feeding for preterm babies. Now there is, of course, a slight increase in jaundice in babies who are fed breast milk as compared to formula milk. But remember, advantages of human milk trump over disadvantages. Now, some people use the excuse that because the mothers don't have enough milk, or uh, because they <laughs> because they uh, uh, they uh, they are deficient in the macronutrients and vitamins, let us give them human um, formula milk. And indeed, it is true that if you give these babies formula milk, they will gain fast, weight gain faster and they will grow in linear growth faster. The weight gain in formula fed babies is mainly due to water retention rather than muscle and tissue mass development, which is seen in human milk feeding. We do not subscribe to this. Excuse me. We do not subscribe to this 
this policy, we would much rather use milk. And I know there are similar problems with dough milk because of time of delivery, the length it is stored, and most importantly, uh, the effect of pasture pasteurization uh, on the donor milk. It, it contain, continues to have the lipid content, but probiotics are lost and water soluble vitamins are lost and the immunoglobulins and the lactoferrins and the cytokines are lost. And of course, the quality of the donor milk also changes from where it is collected, whether it's four milk or hind milk and how it is stored and how it is expressed. And there are of course some religious issues, but when you compare donor milk to preterm milk, you, this is a Canadian study which shows that mortality rate is much less, NEC rate is much less, but in this particular study, and I show it for a particular reason, is that they have uh, they had higher incidence of late onset sepsis uh, compared to formula feeding. The reason was the, the donor milk was not uh, stored properly, and once they corrected that, the, the, the late onset incidence uh, fell dramatically. So one of the problems with donor milk, and I know that some people have in, in the academic um, uh, uh, group have discussed about forming bank uh, milk banks in Pakistan. One has to be very careful about infection. As I said, the breast human milk may not be sufficient, and so there is very great need to fortify it very early on. There is great B evidence because if you want to give totally exclusive human feed, uh, milk without any fortification, you will need something like 300 mils per kilo per day, which is not possible. The question is should be started. Uh, people have started it at 40 mils per kg uh, of feeding to uh, to waiting waiting till 100 mils per kg. We do it at 60, and the evidence is grade B. It shows that uh, there's better growth, better head growth, better less weight loss, and less, uh, uh, less chances of chronic lung disease, and there is no increase in NEC. Does fortification work? Indeed, it does. Cochrane meta-analysis shows there's better weight gain, better length gain, linear growth, and better head circle. Which fortified to use? Again, because we have a policy of using only exclusive milk-based uh, things, we tend to use milk, human milk-based fortified because it has less incidence of NEC, less incidence of late onset sepsis, and less incidence of ROP. We we discourage the use of bovine-based milk. Now, having said all that, and having given all the antenatal advice and, and, and persuade, trying to persuade uh, some mother, uh, mothers to uh, uh, breastfeed their, their preterm babies, some mothers do not. And that has to be accepted. And there is great evidence that these babies then should be given formula milk to start off with, and then very quickly move onto formula. But remember that the preterm formula has a higher osmolality and that may cause a little bit of a problem uh, with gastric aspirates and abdominal distension. Second issue is when to start feeding. We start if possible in the delivery room or certainly as soon as the baby has been stabilized by giving colostrum. And we get colostrum by squeezing the mother's breast a breast, uh, collecting it in a spoon, putting it in a syringe, and giving it into the mouth of the baby. The reason why we do that is because colostrum is very rich in anti-infective properties. It is very rich in lactose, which I showed you, helps in absorption. And more importantly, as you know, the babies do not get uh, IG, uh, IgM from the mother. Lacto um, colostrum is rich source of IgM, which prevents gram-negative infection, and it's a rich source of secretory IgA, which lines the gut and therefore reduces the chances of necrotizing enterocolitis. Colostrum also has many, many oligosaccharides in large amounts. And this is shows, this last graph shows you the functional activity of lactoferrin. There's hardly any in cow's milk, which is the formula milk. I mean, even in mature milk, there's very little, but in colostrum, it's six, 10 to eight, 10 times higher. And that's why we choose to use colostrum. There are some small studies which shows better weight gain in level of 
respiratory IgA and lactobacillus reducing the gut microbiome. We start trophic or minimal feeding priming nutrition from day one because fasting, you know very well, it reduces the gut villi, it breaks down the villi, it increases the chances of getting infections from the gut. We tend to start with five mils if babies are less than 800, 10 mils if the baby is more than 800, and 20 mils if the baby is uh, uh, 1500 grams or more, but we start it on day one and the uh, grade of evidence is grade A. When to start feeding early or delayed? As I said, we start early. There are 43 combined studies, six over 6,000 preterm babies. Some people delay feeding because of fear of NEC. There is no evidence that it, it increases NEC. There is certainly better growth and shorter time to feed early feeding, there's delayed feeding increases the risk of late onset sepsis and long uh, prolongs the stay of baby in the unit. Uh, feeding after grade, stay in grade, in grade one and grade two NEC, we tend to start after day five. Some people wait till day 10. This is our uh, flow chart, which we use in our unit. When not to start enter feedings, again, the evidence is grade A. Uh, grade A, there are absolute contraindications and there are relative contraindications, and you will find this in any textbooks, and I'm quite happy to discuss this at question time. One of the interesting things which I found uh, going through the literature is that particularly in the United States, they, some units you routinely use glycerin suppositories. And the idea is to increase gut motility and to get rid of any meconium which may be stuck uh, stuck there. The evidence, and there have been two meta-analyses, one five, six years ago, and one only two months ago, which showed that it has no effect on mortality. It has no effect on, uh, in fact, it uh, increases the trend towards NEC. There's no uh, effect on improving enteral feeding from uh, TPN, and certainly no evidence that uh, it um, makes meconium evacuation better. So we do not use it, and the, and the evidence I've shown you is grade A, not to use glycerin suppositories routinely. What about feed intolerance? This is something which people worry about, uh, the gastric aspirate, we do not routinely gas, uh, measure uh, gastric aspirate. And the two points I want to make <clears throat> is that 14% of healthy infants have green or bile stained aspirate. So having a little green aspirate does not always, should not always ring alarm bells. This is our protocol. We do not, as I said, feed intolerance should be evaluated frequently early, but um, we do not to routine gastric aspiration. But if the baby is, has got abdominal distension or vomiting and, and, and the gastric residue is more than 33% of the previous feed, we would then uh, hold the feed and ask the doctors to come and review the baby. Whether to increase the feeds faster or slower, there have been uh, 10 RCTs, over 3,700 preterm infants, slow 18 mils per kg versus 30 to 40 mils per kg, Faster group is better, which is full feed earlier, no difference in uh, NEC or late onset sepsis. The SPGAN recent uh, recommendations uh, last week suggest to increase by 30 to 40 mils by after four days. We tend to do it uh, from day three, but that's a debatable thing whether you do it from day three or day four. The question is how often should we be feeding? Again, great, uh, evidence is great, uh, grade A. I want to get rid of this, I don't know. Grade A, how often two hourly, three hourly or continuous combined results of six trials, over 800 babies, slight increase in weight gain, but also increase in gastric residue with continuous feeding. For babies over 1,000 grams, no difference in attaining full feeds, whether you give them two hourly or three hourly. For babies less than 1,000 grams, two hourly feeds appear to be better. How should we feed them? Nasogastric, orogastric, nasogastric versus transpyloric, continuous versus intermittent, push or gravity, just leave the syringe as many people do uh, and let the milk drip into the, uh, into the baby. Combined studies, 20 studies, over 1,400, nearly 1,400 preterm infant, more pathogenic bacteria with nasogastric feeding. So we do not suggest 
uh, recommend nasogastric feeding. We prefer orogastric feeding. It increases the work of breathing, increased mortality with transpyloric feeding. Again, gone, we don't ever use it. Better weight gain with intermittent feeding uh, than continuous feeding. And remember, if you do uh, dip, uh, just let the milk uh, in the syringe and let it drip, all the fat sticks to the plastic of the syringe and the tube. And so the quality of nutrition and the fat the baby gets is much less. But what is more in important, if you allow, apply a little bit of breast milk into the lips and the cheeks of the baby, that increases the secretory IgA and decreases the incidence of NEC and sepsis. How do we promote uh, enteral feeding? By giving kangaroo care, or should we give bottle feeding to improve the sucking reflex of the baby? Nurse, how, when should we feed? When the nurse feels the baby is hungry or when the baby is telling us he, he or she is hungry? 56 studies, four, over 4,000 infants, none of the above has shown uh, to be of any, uh, any difference. But a more recent study published three years ago uh, by Song and Gular shows that non nutritive uh, orosomatic sensory stimulation at 26 to 30 weeks of infant shortened the time to reach full feeds and reduced the length of stay uh, by 10 days. And this is what our practice is. How much to feed volume? There are no comparative studies. There are 18 guidelines uh, suggest if you're less than 34 weeks, TPN transition, enteral feed starting at 40 to 60, maximum 180. Uh, if you're more than 34 weeks, TPN, then transition, enteral feed six, starting at 60 to 80, maximum up to 200. My personal practice is less than 34 weeks, TPN transition start at 60. We are more generous, go to 200. If more than uh, 34 weeks, start 60 to 80 and a maximum of uh, uh, 180. But we always like to give something like 120 to 130 kilocalories per day. Now, there are two very, very interesting studies which have been published within the last year or so. And this is from Mank. Uh, what they did was to add 2,000 units or 400 units of recumbent insulin per, per mil of mil milk for 28 days and showed that if you added 2,000 units of insulin, the time to reach full feeds was much faster. Now, this study needs to be repeated, uh, but it seems uh, a very interesting concept uh, to use. But I'm much more impressed by this study, which was published uh, six, four weeks ago from Mexico. What they did was to cover the baby's head and eyes, uh, the head and the eyes uh, for, uh, by a helmet for, or a cap for 12 hours a day. Uh, and when they did that, these babies had a better milk intake. Their weight gain was better, these black lines, and the length of hospital stay was less. But far more important, uh, what they did was they looked at salivary melatonin. As you know, melatonin is, a, uh, is excreted when we sleep, uh, when there is darkness, uh, light. It is, a, uh, it is required for regeneration of brain and for repair of brain. The, all the damage which I'm doing to your brains at this moment by giving this lecture will be recovered by your melatonin when you go to bed tonight. And this melatonin is much higher in babies who had uh, eyes and head covered for 12 hours. And this is something which you can do very easily. Probiotics, well, they be, I know there is a, a lecture in this series on probiotics, so I'll not say very much except that it's been studied both in developed countries where it has been shown to reduce NEC and mortality, infection debatable. In, in lower middle income countries, it, uh, 33 studies over nearly 11,000 babies, all cause mortality, neonatal sepsis, and necroenterocolitis, enterocolitis were decreased. The debate is not, not uh, whether to use uh, probiotics or not. The question is whether to use one single strain or multiple strain, but whatever you use, it is much better to have lactobacillus and bifidobacter species within your preparation. Some very simple three issues about feed or not to feed during blood transfusion. You should not feed during blood transfusion but how to how long do you, should you wait before starting feeding there is no uh, evidence to suggest either way but there is tendency in the uh, neonatal population towards restriction about pda when there's a hemodynamically significant pda and you're treating it whether to feed or not the evidence is not there out there so we don't know what is the best way to do and that's why i've given the evidence as x i don't know the answer and 
What about umbilical lines? If there are umbilical lines, there's no contraindication to feed. Of course, you need umbilical lines out as soon as possible. Last but not least, monitoring grade A evidence. We should be monitoring babies anthropometrically, weights and lengths, bloods and biochemical monitoring. You can choose whichever way, how often you do that, depending on your circumstances. The dietary intake is the most important. And it's not just getting a number, how much protein we are giving or how many kilocalories are we giving. It's the actual, but not the prescribed. How much is the baby actually getting? That is the most important. And the clinical examination, looking at the baby, whether the baby is wasting rashes, if there's uh, essential fatty acid deficiency, the baby will get dry skin and develop a rash. Or if there is an extra need to give more calories or more energy, if the baby has chronic lung disease or necrotic advertising enterocolitis. The baby's the growth should be plotted. We tend to use Fenton charts. You can use any chart you like. We need to make sure that we are meeting the needs of the baby. And we need to make sure that mother is getting good advice and mother is giving being given support for breastfeed clearly with kangaroo care. Does having a standard policy was the question uh, which Dr. Nazir put to me, uh, uh, policy lead to a better care or better practice? Why should we standardize? Because it gives you better care. It gives you interpretable results. It eliminates outliers. So majority of your people, babies will be getting feeds here and not dependent on these outliers who say, well, I will do what I want to do. There's uh, some people don't like, don't, do not like standardized policies because they think they will lose control and they will lose the importance of decision-making because as a consultant, you should be making the decision. Well, uh, I think those days have gone now. And I think what should be we standardize is the nutrient delivery, energy targets, nutrient targets, growth goals, and I, I hope for, the, for the 90 to 95% compliance. These goals must be standardized in your protocol. Because if you look at the data coming from 16 studies, as I said, 13, nearly 1,300 preterm babies, if you have a standardized protocol, it will reduce your time on trophic feeding, it will reduce you, uh, get you to full enteral feeding much sooner and reduce the uh, weight onset sepsis. But more importantly, since our group seems to be uh, fixed on uh, ventilation, I just I just put this very importantly, uh, that the duration of CPAP is reduced by 23% and the duration of ventilation is reduced by 35%. So you will get a better outcome just by improving the nutrition rather than fixing the ventilators. Reduce uh, parental nutrition by three to five days, and that's reducing and uh, removing the central lines. And in fact, the length of stay re is reduced by 15 days. Now, which is important in high income countries because of the cost, but with you in Pakistan, it is important because it will, the pressure on cots which you have in your units. So, this is a basic summary which I have said what to feed human milk and fortification, feed early, use non nutrient feeding, yes, trophic feeding and colostrum. Depends on what you start. We start at 60, we increase at 30. We do not do regular gastric aspiration. We plus minus use probiotics. If human milk and fortification is not available, then only we use formula or skim milk. We use nurse based or baby based uh, directed feeding regimen. We do not stop and start. Nobody in our unit in the morning would say stop the feeding. And then somebody doing the afternoon rounds say start the feeding. That the nurses will not allow you the, to do that. We stick to our feeding protocol and we aim to achieve uh, much higher <coughs> compliance. This for every item I have discussed in our in our uh, protocol, we have a flow uh, flow guide. So it tells you by weight, it tells you by days what to do exactly, what to do, what the exemptions are. So you will find that for every uh, particular item. I want to finish off by giving you the post discharge, which has been changed a little bit. Whether you should discharge a preterm babies home on post discharge formulas uh, or preterm formulas, there is recent evidence to suggest. Postnatal breast milk, continuing with human milk uh, uh, fortification, and this has been tested against three different formula milks, and there is no difference in the postnatal growth. So we tend to send mothers home on human milk plus fortification and ask them to continue doing that. But if you don't have that, then, uh, then you should send them on post 
uh, discharge milk, but you will not see a, a great deal of difference till about four, six to eight, nine months when these babies on pre, uh, process discharge formula grow. So to take to work message is having a standardized feeding protocol improves nutrition growth and reduces short, medium, and long-term compl uh, complication. Early exclusive human milk enteral nutrition in preterm infants is safe, feasible, and significantly improves outcome. New development and metabolic consequences of our feeding regimens should always be kept in mind. And there are accepted, there will be exceptions, and those exceptions must be dealt with. I'd like to thank you and quite happy to answer any questions. Hello? 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 Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, sir. 